go. Welcome to another night of the 2021 ASF virtual conference. I have my partner in crime here with me tonight, my husband, Adam, and we're just so thankful to have you guys on for um, another night. And y'all, you're in for a treat tonight. As I've been promising you all week, we have an amazing group of panelists to talk about behavior and anxiety in Angelman syndrome, which I know is something that we all deal with at one point of this journey. So we're excited to hear from these awesome individuals tonight. And we're just really happy you're, you're here with us tonight. Also wanna remind you tomorrow night will be the last night of our evenings. Um, we will be um, not kicking off with Dr. Ron Siebert to talk all things seizures. So you will have an hour or more to sit and ask everything that you would ever want to ask to seizures to Dr. Siebert, who has been working in this in this field for so long. So that will be tomorrow night. So before I kick it off, because no one wants to hear from us, <laughs> I made Adam come on. So for those of you who have been watching every single night, you know that I've been saying the same thing every single night before we kick it off. So I brought my husband on to tell people about it tonight. How can we raise $50,000 for Angelman Syndrome Foundation? If you text <laughs> ASS to 90412, you can sign up. It's really easy. Um, you can give information, feedback on uh, little surveys. And for each survey you do, you get two bucks. You can do 75, you can raise $150. No problem, it is really easy, too easy. Too easy, and $50,000, and especially for the, everyone who's on the call tonight with us, knows $50,000 goes a long way for, the, for our foundation, right? Whether it's clinic support, whether it's supporting the ladder database, whether it's working on different projects in the community, $50,000 is a lot. So if you haven't done so yet, sign up. If you have done so, please, please just give your feedback. That's all you got to do. We have till August 19th to do that. So without further ado, we'll stop talking. And I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Liz Gelazzo, who is going to lead our amazing panelists tonight. All right. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you to the community who is joining us. This is so fun. I love every night watching all the attendees fill in. Um, it's another great turnout tonight and for good reason. So I am joined by a fabulous team of behavioral health experts tonight, and we are going to talk about all things behavior and anxiety. Um, I will do quick introductions and then I'm going to turn it right over to them. We're going to do things a little bit differently if you've joined us the past couple of nights. Um, our docs tonight have put together a presentation, so um, I'm going to let them talk for the first 30 minutes or so, um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. As we've done the past couple of nights, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. We'll try to man both. Um, if you put your hand up, we don't know how to manage that, so don't put your hand up um, or put it up, but we'll direct you back to the question and answer box. Um, all right, without further ado, I will introduce our um, panel tonight, and then I will turn it over to them to take it away. So we are joined um, by Dr. Chris Keery, who is a child adolescent adolescent and adult um, psychiatrist at Mass General Hospital. Going around my screen, we also have Dr. Cesar Ochoa Lubinoff, who is a um, pediatric, a developmental behavioral pediat pediatrician, gosh, um, that's a mouthful, at um, Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Um, we have Anjali Sadwani, who is a child psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital, um, and Ann Wheeler, who's also a child psychologist, um, whose day job is at RTI. International in Raleigh, North Carolina, but we have the pleasure of also having her in our um, Angelman Clinic at UNC. Um, so I'm going to turn it over, I think, to you, Anjali, to um, take it away. You are still muted. Perfect. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so what we're going to do today is I'm just going to, we're going to go over and do an overview of what are the commonly observed behavior challenges in individuals with AS. We're gonna be talking a little bit about anxiety as a root of the behavioral concerns. We talk about the relationship of autism in, in, our, in our kids. We discuss some environmental and behavior strategies to help with the behavioral concerns. And then Chris and Caesar will talk about the medical strategies and then we'll open it up for questions. So we know that behavior problems are common in individuals with AS. They interfere with their ability to interact well in the social environment. We know that the differences in the frequency and severity of behavior problems based on molecular subtypes. 
These behavior problems are often a source of stress for caregivers and impact family quality of life. So how common are these behavior problems? This is data from the natural history study using 300 participants. As we can see across the subtypes, mouthing behaviors are very common. A lot of our kids have difficulties with the short attention span. Aggressive behaviors are also very common, though they differ in how they're, they're manifested. For example, biting is more common in UB3A kids, hair pulling in the UPD imprinting kids, and pinching in the UPD imprinting kids. Anxiety is most common in the UPD imprinting kids, and temper tantrums is most seen in the UPD kids. We know behavior problems occur, but how do they change over the lifespan? When we look at irritability, we see that in the deletion kids, irritability remains low through the lifespan, while um, imprinting and UBD as well as UB3 and mutation kids, the irritability increases over time. However, on the other hand, if we look at hyperactivity, for all molecular subtypes, it's mildly elevated and remains elevated over time. On the other hand, when we look at more other behaviors like pinching, we notice that the kids with UB UBD and imprinting have higher rates of print, uh, pinching behaviors than kids with deletion and UB3 mutation. When we look at anxiety, we notice that the deletion kids have lower rates of anxiety compared to those, those other types. So I think it's really important that we think about what these, uh, what we mean when we talk about anxiety and what we mean when we talk about autism. Um, so it's it's helpful um, to see the graphs that uh, Anjali showed to know that um, if you have a child who is experiencing a lot of behavior problems, um, you're not alone. This is a common uh, situation for individuals with Angelman, but they look different across, as Anjali pointed out, across different subtypes as well as within each individual. So um, just turning a little bit to anxiety, if you want to go to the next slide, Anjali. Um, you know, when we think about the clinical features, like when we when we look at what um, what are some of the things that are associated with with Angelman, anxiety is often listed as a characteristic. But what do we mean when we talk about anxiety? And I think that's a really this is a really challenging piece. Um, as a parent, you may look at your child's behavior and be able to say, "I know them. I know them. I'm I'm the expert in my child, and this is anxiety for them." Um, but that anxiety, what we might call anxiety, may look or be called something different from by somebody else, but even by another parent potentially. So one of the things we know is that when parents talk about anxiety in children with Angelman, um, they often describe irritability and agitation in response to anxiety, um, things like restlessness, distractibility, changes in behavior. It usually increases in, in types of behaviors that they may um, in, engage in, they may, there may be more crying or screaming, there may be increases in aggression. Um, and then they, you also, also may be reporting things like seeing more sweating or other somatic issues, more vomiting, shaking, those types of things. And you associate those with anxiety, which they very well could be. Um, one of the challenges though, is that because most of the kids we know in Angelman do not um, have the capacity to let us know what it is they're experiencing, either verbally or even through um, communication devices. It makes it very hard to know, um, is, it, is it that we're treating anxiety or is there an underlying pain issue, underlying GI issue, um, or is this more communication frustration? Um, and another added layer to, to this that's complicate, that complicates the matter is that um, from a diagnostic standpoint, or even from an FDA standpoint, anxiety is considered an internal disorder, which requires the ability, the individual to be able to describe their internal experiences. And so um, this is, becomes another challenge for kids with Angelman who cannot describe that. Um, so when we set out to try to understand what was happening here um, with anxiety, when, when we first opened the UNC clinic, we had several cases um, of older adult, older kids, um, young adults, where we saw um, what looked to us um, what we might describe as separation anxiety, just more challenges with um, being separated from a primary caregiver. And this was a behavior that was being described um, as a challenge for families. And then we were also observing it in the clinic. So um, 
I don't know that we need to go through these case studies actually, but essentially what we found, what we saw, we started to see these in multiple kit, multiple individuals. And so we went ahead and set out to study it because we have our research hats on. Um, and so we asked a bunch of questions to families um, across the country about whether or not they felt like there was an anxiety concern, whatever they, however they defined anxiety. Um, and as you can see, there was um, an increase in age in our sample um, with anxiety problem, with anxiety concerns. So parents of young children, kids under five, were less likely to um, indicate that their individual with Angelman syndrome had anxiety. But by the time those individuals were about um, in adolescence to young adulthood, uh, there was a much higher percentage of parents who were describing anxiety concerns. And so we, we also wanted to know, well, all these behaviors we're seeing in clinic, are these things that are typically being seen in the population? And they were. So um, as you can see, uh, caregiver pref having a preference for one caregiver that um, leads to agitation when, that, when somebody comes in between you, the individual with Angelman and the caregiver, um, or agitation when you, they lose the attention of that person, um, was, we were seeing that. And they're seeing it... Um, with increasing age, so less often with younger children, as we mentioned. Um, but by the time you get into adolescence, um, they're seeing this quite a bit. Almost, almost every everybody was describing this as a as a problem. Uh, um, Seventy five percent, two third, or, two, or almost everybody. Um, so this was something that um, I don't. We hadn't really. It has been described anecdotally, but um, hadn't really been um, captured too much in the literature. We also looked at this based on subtype. Um, and similar to the way uh, to some of the behavior challenges that have been found in the natural history study, we also saw that um, kids with UP, uh, UP, UB3A mutation were the ones that were most likely to um, be reported to have anxiety concerns. Um, and UB3A and UPD were the two groups that tended to, they were a little bit more, more likely to have um, challenges with caregiver preference um, and, and the agitation that we were seeing in clinic. Um, less, less so for the kids with deletion, although you can still see that we had about half of the sample um, that were uh, describing those concerns. Okay, next slide. Um, so we're gonna talk some, some more in a, in a bit about, about how we handle some of the concerns when it comes to anxiety, um, some of the strategies that we recommend families try. Um, both in, including both behavioral strategies as well as um, uh, pharmacological strategies. So I also want to touch on autism because um, autism has been described as being, uh, Angelman has been described as being a syndrome of autism. Um, and there is a high comor comorbidity when we look at it from a, um, a diagnostic standpoint based on the measures that are administered to individuals with, with Angelman. But I want to talk a little bit about the differences because I think it's important. Um, so with Angelman, as you all know, this is a genetic diagnosis. Um, and the big difference with, with autism is that it's completely behaviorally diagnosed. We do not have a genetic test for autism yet. Um, and so, so that's sort of the foundation for the differences here. Um, and autism is defined by deficits in social communication and restricted or repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. Those are the two core sets of symptoms. Um, it also has to be present early in, in development. And an important caveat is that the behaviors that are being um, indicated in autism are not better explained by intellectual disability. Um, and just generally speaking, autism is very difficult to diagnose in children who are developmentally younger than 18 months. So um, you may already be starting to see a picture of why this is challenging for, for us in Angelman syndrome. Um, of course, we see deficits in communication. Um, in some ways, they're very similar to what we might see in autism. In other ways, they're very different than what we might see in autism. Um, you also may see repetitive movements in Angelman syndrome. Again, some of it's similar, some of it's quite different. Um, both conditions have comorbid seizures, um, but in autism, you're more likely to see macrocephaly, so a bigger head, whereas in Angelman, you're more likely to see microcephaly, so smaller head. Um, an important caveat for me with Angelman syndrome and what I find is one of the bigger distinguishing factors is that um, with kids with Angelman syndrome tend to be more socially interested. So they may not be socially appropriate um, and they may not be able to communicate in um, a, a typically developing way, um, but the, the social interest is very different than what we might see in autism. And of course, given the fact that many children with, with Angelman um, sort of 
max out on our cognitive test anyway at about a 12 to 24 month level, this makes it very, very challenging to determine if the measures that we give that we would normally use to assess autism um, are even appropriate for kids with um, Angelman syndrome. So having said that, um, if, if your child with Angelman is assessed, um, they are likely to be given an autism diagnosis. And sometimes having an autism diagnosis can open up services and can um, uh, allow access to interventions that may be very supportive and helpful for, um, for your child. So just a caveat and something to, to consider um, when autism comes up, if, it, if autism comes up. Okay, next slide. All right, so the, the part that's most important, we wanted to give a little background, but the part that's most important um, here, I'm sure um, for all of you, is understanding what kind of strategies may be helpful. So we're going to start with environmental strategies. So really, this is more like how can we, um, as, a, as uh, adults, scaffold our, um, in, our children and our, in, and our loved ones with Angelman's uh, world in a way that can support them and reduce behaviors. Uh, and so next slide, Anjali. <clears throat> um, one of the most important things to remember is that all behavior has a function. There's always a reason for a behavior. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's these four functions of behavior that are generally accepted as being like the primary reasons why behaviors occur. And there's two different ways that you can sort of remember this. One is everyone eats, which essentially is everyone has these behaviors, have behaviors that are in, in response to these four functions. Um, and another, one, another way to think about this is rearrange the letters and it's seat. Either way, what we're looking for is, is a behavior a way of escaping something? Is the behavior a way of getting attention? Is the, beha is the behavior, um, the function of the behavior to get something tangible, like a activity or a preferred item? Or is the behavior in response to or in um, pursuit of a sensory input? And so if you start to think about any behavior within those four categories, um, you can really start to, um, understand what might be behind the behavior. And that's the, one of the key ways of trying to intervene to um, reduce, the reduce the behaviors that are challenging and improve behaviors that um, we wanna see happen more often. Um, and so I think Anjali is gonna talk through a little bit about how we, how we assess these functions. So one of the things that we're looking at when we are trying to look at problem behaviors, we tend to do something called the functional behavior analysis. The functional behavior analysis is also known as the ABC analysis. So the A stands for an antecedent of like what happened right before the problem behavior occurred. Um, B is the behavior, is what is the problem behavior and what followed it. We're trying to essentially, when we do this functional behavior analysis, we're trying to find, figure out what the triggers of behavior are or the reasons as Anne said, and the context and the frequency of behaviors. So let's talk up through an example. The teacher will tell 10 year old Pete in the classroom, let's sit in a circle. Pete then goes ahead and pulls another child's hair. Because of that, the aide takes Peter out, out of the room. As you can clearly see, this is an escape behavior, right? He pulled the child's hair so that he could get out of sitting in the circle. So we figured out that this was a way to escape doing something he wanted to do. So now that we know that each of the behaviors serves a function, we wanna figure out not only how we identify the behavior, but also see what are the different purposes that Angelman kids have of these behaviors. This is data from the recent natural history study where we asked parents, what do you think is the reason your child is doing these behaviors? As you can see, a high proportion of our parents said is because of communication. This was followed by that kids are, are craving sensory input, their attention seeking, and 22% said they're doing it to avoid or escape from behavior. Once we figure out the reason of why, why a behavior occurs, we want to figure out an effective way of teaching them new behavior. For example, if the function of behavior is communication, a child is doing something because they cannot communicate, we want to be giving them more effective ways of communicating their needs. I think AAC uh, devices are very helpful in that so that uh, children can communicate their needs. It's really essential that the AAC device is available to the, and accessible to the individual at all times during the day. It's integrated in their, in their daily life. It's present both at home and at school, as well as the medical appointments, because that's the most anxiety provoking. And if the child does not have his device, he is going to uh, speak out in other ways. If we notice that the behavior, the functioning uh, is sensory, for example, if the child is biting, 
we because they're mouthing things. We want to work with OT to identify more appropriate calming input. The, uh, working, you want to deal with more sensory aversions, dealing with loud noises, crowded places, figure out uh, techniques to take them in a quiet, quiet place, use of headphones. If they're sensory seeking, if they're mouthing or biting, giving them more chewy tubes would really help reduce some of those behaviors. Okay, and then um, if we think that, if we determine that the function of behavior is more about gaining attention, um, the key strategy here is, um, is differential reinforcement of behaviors so that you are providing more attention for behaviors that you wanna see. And whenever possible, ignoring, although I know it's not always easy to ignore um, or redirecting in order to um, not give too much attention to that undesirable, whatever behavior it is that you're trying to um, reduce. And this is, there's, a, with all of these strategies, there's always a challenge that um, often you'll see what we call a behavior burst, where as soon as you try to intervene and change that behavior, you're going to actually see it increase at first. So it really takes quite a bit of um, consistency and sort of not giving up, even though it sort of may not feel like it's working right away. Um, and these are these are challenging things. It's not um, it's not easy to change behaviors. It's not easy to change somebody else's behavior, especially if that also requires you have to change your own behavior too. So, um, but these are some of the things that that we know work. Um, if the if the function is escape, um, often what we can do is try to um, determine what it is that it's, it's the individual is trying to escape from, and have them still do the behavior. We don't want them to be able to escape from it completely, but give them smaller chunks of, of time that's required with worked in breaks so that they don't have to run away from it. They know they get a break coming up. Um, increasing opportunities to choose um, and when appropriate, allowing that escape. So when, when they've done you know, a, a certain amount of whatever it is that they're being asked to do or they're being, able to, uh, being asked to escape from, then allowing that escape and giving them a safe place to, to, to go to um, once, that, once they've done that behavior. Next slide. Um, in addition, there are several other types of environmental and um, uh, behavioral strategies that uh, we found have been really helpful for reducing behaviors. Um, one is to have a consistent routine. You'll probably hear this from many professionals <laughs> um, and having and using visual schedules where possible. So reducing the um, requirement that that language is needed and, and needed to be understood in order to comply with a with a request. Um, timers. Uh, visual timers can help, um, or you know, even even Alexa's. <laughs> um, again, having shorter shorter durations, using breaks as needed, having re using reinforcement, praising when you want it, when you see what you want. Um, if if a child has the un the understanding of a of first then, um, using that as much as possible, you can use pictures and boards. So if we finish this task, or if you, you know, use quiet hands, then we can um, have a preferred activity um, or you get to escape. Um, and whenever you know there's going to be a big transition that might increase behaviors, planning for that, having some calming activities involved, um, using visual schedules to let them know that this is what's coming. Um, but I can't emphasize enough that really if the behaviors are super challenging and you want to have a functional behavioral um, analysis done and really be able to come up with a plan for your family that will help change the behaviors, working with a behavioral specialist is really going to be crucial. Um, you can certainly try any of these on your own, but um, and, and often that will help and work. But if they become, um, the behaviors are, are persistent and it's, um, it's, challenging for you to do, having a behavioral specialist who can work with you and really break down what the, what the challenges are in order to help those strategies be implemented in a way that's most effective can be really useful. Um, and then if that is still not working, <laughs> um, or even if it is working, um, we can still we can start to think about when is it um, helpful to move into um, pharmacological interventions. And so we'll pass the baton here um, to Dr. Curie and Dr. Ocha Lubinoff. You're on mute. Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about medication-based treatments for behavioral and emotional concerns. Next, please. So um, 
like it has been described, uh, and we all that work will have um, work with uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome know that behavioral and emotional challenges can be very significant and can be a big source of stress to household members and people around um, individuals with Angelman syndrome. So uh, when to consider medication for behavior, for emotions, when there is lack of improvement with behavioral treatments, when there are concerns about safety, when there's no preparation that can be made that is enough for a community uh, trip that is safe, when um, Angelman syndrome individuals are not eligible for day programs or uh, because of safety reasons. So, and it also applies to schools when and behaviors at school are very disruptive uh, and when parents feel uh, unsafe to place any demands. So something that is important to say about medications for behavior and emotional regulation is that individuals with Angelman syndrome um, have a little more sensitivity to uh, medications that are used for anxiety and for behavior. They have a higher prevalence of side effects. So does that mean that we shouldn't try them? No, we can still try them, but we need to be mindful that um, there might be side effects on the way. Uh, but it's, when it's indicated, when these medications are indicated, it's worth to give a try because the side effects are generally reversible and um, you know, they stop once you stop the medication. And it's really important to have a good communication with the uh, physician that is managing the medication. It's very important to be very upfront about your concerns. And also when you start the medication, be very communicating your, your concerns about side effects and have a good fluid communication. That's gonna be key. And sometimes the first or second medication may not work but the information you collect from those experiences may help to decide a third intervention that eventually may work. Next, please. So we have a case, Alice is a 19 year old woman with Angelman syndrome uh, with uh, uniparental disomy. Uh, she was born full term. She spoke, at, she started walking at six years of age and she says a couple of words, part of words to make some requests. Something that has been noticed and is the main concern from parents is that she's increasingly upset with separation from parents. There is agitation with limit setting, particularly around food, and uh, the community outings are getting increasingly unpredictable and dangerous. Next, please. So what do we do as clinicians when we, as physicians that are, have the potential to prescribe medication? Something that is really important is first, to look for a medical cause, like a medical condition that could be making this particular patient irritable or uh, emotional. So um, constipation, we know is a common um, condition in patients with Angelman syndrome. Reflux is more common in younger, um, younger patients with Angelman syndrome, but it can also happen in adolescents and adults. As females get into puberty and have their periods, we need to think about uh, painful menstrual periods, dental problems should not be overlooked. We should always think about dental problems as a source of chronic irritability. Scoliosis is also very prevalent and that could be a source of pain and irritability. And, and something that happens uh, relatively frequently in patients with Angelman syndrome are seizures. So unrecognized seizures that cause this post-ictal confusion can be a source of irritability and also the same medications that are used to treat seizures can sometimes cause irritability. So it's, it's, some, it's really important to, to keep in mind those conditions. Also something that is not here, but Dr. Thierry is gonna talk about is sleep difficulties can also be a contributing factor for irritability during daytime. Next, please. So, um, um, so what to do when we have a, a, a patient that has, um, when parents have this concern like Alice, that there is increased anxiety and uh, parents are feeling unsafe at home and it's really hard to get um, her out for outings. So the first is look, ruling out medical contributors, getting a good history, doing a good exam. We can use occupational therapy like has been mentioned before. Next, please. Um, communication. Communication is a big challenge for patients with Angelman syndrome, but um, we try augmentative alternative communication strategies. And if we are able to 
to get them effective, that can help a lot with uh, behavioral challenges. Next, please. So behavioral therapy, uh, it has been very well described how behavioral therapy can help with uh, behavioral and emotional challenges. Next, please. So psychological therapy, counsel. Counseling sometimes can be helpful in that the counselor can coach parents to address these anxiety situations and can help them um, deal with them and not reinforce. Sometimes parents inadvertently can, uh, with the responses, can enhance these behaviors. So it's really important um, to get some counseling. And sometimes these counselors can help parents do a gradual exposure to these situations that can be stressful for animal syndrome patients. Next, please. So uh, medication. Um, so we have uh, buspiron. Buspirum is a second or third line medication for anxiety in uh, individuals um, in, the, in, general, in the general population. It has an effect on serotonin and, and that's the way it helps. It has a, a, a positive effect on serotonin receptor 1A and that way it helps with anxiety. So, but something that we have discovered is that the typical uh, medications that we use for anxiety in the general population like serotonin, selective reuptake inhibitors like Zoloft or Sertraline or Fluoxetine or Prozac uh, or Esotilopram or Lexapro, those medications often cause side effects in individuals with Angelman syndrome. So something that Dr. Kerry and I have been doing is we use buspiron as the first agent. And there are some already some papers um, that describe that if you start with a small dose with buspiron and you can titrate, gradually increase it until you find the sweet spot, you can have uh, improvement in a lot of patients with Angelman syndrome with um, limited uh, frequency of side effects. Next, please. So in the least, but sometimes buspiron, buspiron doesn't work for everybody. And in the least severe cases, next please. So we have, uh, we can still use the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like the ones I mentioned before, like Zoloft, Prozac, or Lexapro. And sometimes they work, but sometimes they cause side effects. But, you know, we usually start with a small dose when we decide to try them, and we gradually increase them to minimize if, if there are side effects. We can also use medications like mirtazapine that has an effect on serotonin. This is an older uh, tricyclic antidepressant that is effective in treating anxiety as well. There are two other types of medications that are used in less severe cases, like the benzodiazepines, like diazepam or Valium or the propanolol, but these medications are used more for specific situations. Like uh, some Angelman syndrome patients get very stressed out when they go to see the doctor so, uh, or seeing the dentist. So you can give some of these medications. We sometimes prescribe these medications for these very anxious situations. Like when they are going to take a trip, they're gonna take a flight and that can be very stressful for the family. So that's the place for these medications. Next, please. And in the more severe cases, you know, sometimes uh, we, we try to avoid this last category of medications called antipsychotic medications, which the name for a starter sounds terrible, but uh, because these medications have a lot of side effects, they, can, they often increase appetite and they increase the risk for metabolic conditions. Like they can increase the risk for hyper increased cholesterol, for diabetes, and uh, so they, they have all these long-term side effects with increased weight. But you know, sometimes the situation is so difficult that uh, there's so much irritability, so much aggression, so much self-injury behavior that sometimes we have to go to these um, medications. And um, we like to use quetiapine, which is a medication that doesn't cause as much of weight gain, not in everybody. And it can be helpful with sleep. We like Abilify also sometimes. And Risperdal can also be helpful, but has a little more frequency for increasing um, appetite and weight and risk for all these metabolic conditions. So they have their place. And sometimes we have to use. Um, I want to say a word about the, these anti-seizure medications. Some of these anti-seizure medications can be helpful with the emotional regulation difficulties. And sometimes neurologists can, when they are aware that there are behavioral challenges or emotional challenges, they may try to use those medications to control seizures. And once in a while we have used them 
uh, to help. I've used the topiramate. Sometimes it has a, an effect on decreasing appetite, and it can also help a little bit with emotional regulation. And uh, lamotrigine or lamictal can also be helpful for uh, emotional regulation. Thank you. Next. All right, so I'm going to jump in here and play cleanup. I'll try to fly here to make sure we get the questions. Thanks, Caesar. Uh, our second case here is um, Sam. Sam Scott. Uh, this is a, a case that's representative for the concern of hyperactivity or distractibility in patients with uh, with Angelman syndrome, which uh, Dr. Sadwani talked a little bit in her research. Um, the parent's main concern with Sam was a constant need to be in movement, constant need for movement breaks at school, um, and it was such that with his therapies, really it was hard to work with Sam for more than really a minute or two at a moment without a constant need to take movement breaks or be distracted by peers. And this led to really slow progress in his speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, despite uh, some gains that Sam, uh, Sam was making in his motor function. Um, any situation where there was a lack of structure for Sam would bring out a lot more giddy hyperactivity. Um, his easy distractibility at school by peers made it very hard for him to be in the general ed environment uh, requiring more separation. Um, and he did not do well with online education, we'll say. <laughs> um, can you move on to the next slide? Um, it's important to emphasize the need for routine exercise, physical activity in kids with significant hyperactivity, both who have Angelman syndrome and uh, other developmental disabilities or neurotypical. Um, ensuring adequate sleep is better, easier said than done, but many of the families I work with with Angelman syndrome will note that when sleep is worse, there may be more hyperactivity in subsequent days. Uh, next. Um, we talked a little bit about educational interventions already, but movement breaks, um, it's important to try and maximize as much as possible inclusion experiences for kids with Angelman syndrome where they can interact with peers and many of my patients really enjoy that. But perhaps for the therapies, it might be helpful like um, work with a speech therapy or physical therapy for that to be one-on-one -on -one to get the best attention um, and to you know, use praise and reward systems as uh, Dr. Wheeler was talking about. Um, and for families uh, and uh, teachers and group home staff to be aware of the risk for falls um, when hyperactivity is present um, in kids and adults who have motor challenges. Uh, next. Uh, occupational therapy was mentioned. They have a, a great deal to offer for uh, kids with and adults with Angelman syndrome around other sensory interventions that can meet the need, um, repetitive chewing, for instance. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what are medicines that can be helpful for hyperactivity in kids and adults who have Angelman syndrome? Guanfacine and clonidine are two medications that what they do essentially is they activate alpha-2 receptors in the body and the brain. And uh, so they do the opposite in some ways of what the fight or flight response is. So if we think about um, big surge of anxiety or anger and um, their heart rate increases and your blood pressure increases and pupils dilate and sweating, it kind of is the opposite of the fight or flight response. And that way uh, it can be a calming medication um, and you know, helpful for hyperactivity. Uh, clonidine tends to be a little more sedating than guanfacine. Uh, next point, um, atomoxetine is also called Stratera. It requires, it needs to be swallowed. So I use it less in Angelman syndrome, but has a research that it can help with hyperactivity in children with developmental disabilities. Uh, number next, uh, serotonergic medications. This is more um, anecdotal experience from other clinicians who work and prescribe with uh, for kids with uh, and adults with Angelman syndrome that they notice some improvement in hyperactivity with medicines that are antidepressants, which seem a little counterintuitive, but that's sort of more been an anecdotal experience. I mentioned Prozac, which is fluoxetine here and amitriptyline. And next, antipsychotic medications, as Dr. Ochoa talked about, is really should be considered in just the most severe situations because of the risk for increased appetite and movement side effects that require close monitoring from an evaluator. So it is generally not recommended as first line and to be considered only in urgent or unsafe situations, but they can be helpful. Uh, next slide. Uh, then our last case, and we'll open it up for questions. Jaden is 14. Uh, Jaden um, did quite well with behavior um, until the pandemic hit. And then once the pandemic hit, 
Everyone in the family with Jaden is working from home and all of a sudden Jaden starts to expect that he is going to be spending time with his parents all the time and starts to not understand why uh, he needs to say goodnight to parents at night. And the, it gets much harder to, um, for him to separate from his, uh, in this case, it was his mom at night, um, like Dr. Wheeler talked about in his research. And it, the family had to start co-sleeping with Jaden. He would have a much harder time with initiating sleep, sometimes hours, and would wake at night and need the parent to be right there. Um, and he had been doing well with melatonin for so long. Uh, next slide. I'll just mention briefly behavioral interventions for helping with uh, sleep. Um, this uh, can be really challenging, but it really should be mentioned when talking about the treatment of sleep problems that these can be helpful for some kids and even adults who have sleep problems in Angelman syndrome. These are sort of four different sort of behavioral strategies, um, the first of which bedtime fading, which is moving the bedtime later and later. So it's using the individual's natural tiredness, which you hope <laughs> at some point you see. Um, and that might mean moving bedtime back to 8, 9, 10, 11 later. Um, and then when sleep initiates well at that point, and you kind of get into a routine with it, then gradually moving the bedtime a little bit earlier once you've got a good system in place. Camping out, which is getting a cot by the bed and gradually moving yourself out. Extinction, modified extinction, which is the perhaps the hardest and um, uh, which is sort of not responding to bids to pull an individual back into the into the uh, sleeping scenario. And the excuse me drill, I like this one where um, and a parent is starting with co-sleeping and they say, oh, uh, Jaden, I'll be right back for a minute. And they leave for a couple seconds and then they come right back and Jaden, you did great waiting for me. And then you extend that time that you're gone by a couple seconds each time, gradually, little by little. Uh, next slide. Uh, sleep hygiene, ensuring consistent sleep time, a quiet, cool sleep environment with blackout curtains, making it really dark. Um, and next point here, training to stay in the Zoom safely. For some uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome, between behavioral interventions and medications, we really only get to moderate improvement. And so getting to that next level may be really um, getting an individual with Angelman syndrome comfortable with staying in their room themselves and whether that's with preferred items or whether that's something like a sleep safe bed that's enclosed um, with a camera in the room to ensure that an individual is safe, um, ensuring that the room doesn't have anything dangerous in it um, and getting an individual used to um, when they wake up, entertaining themselves until they can reinitiate sleep. Sometimes that's required. Um, next slide. And then if those things don't help or while you're pursuing those behavioral interventions, medications can be helpful as well. Melatonin is the only medication, uh, behavioral medicine that has a double blind placebo control trial for it um, in use of in people with Angelman syndrome specifically that showed that it was effective and tolerable for sleep, although not for everyone. Uh, next point here um, and next point after that. Um, great. Clonidine and trazodone can both be really effective for sleep in patients with Angelman syndrome and um, clonidine more effective for sleep initiation, trazodone more effective for sleep maintenance, waking up in the middle of the night. Those are probably between those three, melatonin, clonidine, and trazodone, those are some of the most commonly used medicines for sleep in Angelman syndrome, in my experience, tend to be really well tolerated. There was a case series recently that was published by Dr. Dewey's group that showed improvement with mirtazapine for sleep, and it helped a little bit with behaviors. And uh, last point here, quetiapine. Uh, that's an antipsychotic medication. Again, we're thinking about that at the end, but it can be remarkably helpful for sleep um, and may help with um, problems, behavioral problems during the day. All right, Whew. let's take a break here and open it up for, uh, for questions. Guys, okay, that was an amazing tour de force of all yeah. things, anxiety and behavior, and an amazing glimpse into the way that your brains work when you're thinking about tackling some of these challenges with our, um, with our loved ones. So we have some good questions in the chat box here. So I'm just gonna to launch in. So, um, and these can be open to anybody. So we have a couple of questions about medications and side effects that can be seen with medication. So can you guys elaborate a little bit more on what side effects might, or that you've seen in patients with Angelman syndrome on Buspar or Buspirone, um, as well as with the benzodiazepines? Or like, um, I, I will start. Um, so the, the, you know, all these anxiety medications can um, the the side effects that we pay more attention to 
uh, there can be um, the opposite effect to what we are looking for. You know, there's we're trying to aim for anxiety, for uh, improving anxiety, improving regulation, but sometimes these medications can cause the opposite effect, irritability, more emotionality, mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes there can be some sadness. And, you know, it's described that all these medications that have an effect on anxiety and mood can also have this suicidal ideation, which is harder to gauge in, in a patient with Angelman syndrome, but it's, it's, it's important to monitor um, the mood and the emotions of patients that are taking these medications. I, I recently treated a patient with uh, Buspiron, and uh, the mother told me that her symptoms were actually the opposite that we were aiming for. Like she was a little worse, a little more irritable, a little engaging in more self-injurious behavior. Mm. So we determined that, you know, maybe this is not the right medicine for her and we tried something different. Okay. Yeah, I just add sedation as well as a risk to watch for, you know, if you were uh, increased sedation that can worsen people's motor function. Because I think about it being oftentimes some concentration to make the gains from a motor standpoint for a lot of kids with Angelman syndrome. So be careful about doing more harm than good from that standpoint. Um, and constipation is another important one to watch for. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, what about, can someone clarify the name of the seizure medicine um, that helps with anxiety? I think. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, the, the ones that come to mind for me for medicines that um, control seizures that can also help with easy irritability, aggressive behaviors, uh, quick progression to anxiety or agitation. Um, uh, topiramate comes to mind, lamotrigine comes to mind. Um, and um, other ones that may be worth considering include gabapentin or neurontin. There are a number of anti-seizure medicines that can help with behaviors, but shouldn't be used in Angelman syndrome because they can make seizures worse, uh, like carbamazepine and oxycarbazepine, which is Tegretol, and, uh, and Depakote can make motor function worse. Right. The other that can also um, be thought as an anxiety medication is clobazam. Yeah. Clobazam is an anti-seizure medication that can also be treated as um, an anti-anxiety medication because it's a benzo. Right. Clobazam, which is Omphi. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Can you talk about the use of lithium and clonidine for behavior management? Um, so, uh, well, start with, I'm, I'm more inclined to, to go with clonidine before lithium, although Lithium, I, I, this has been something I've tried. Um, clonidine is a treatment for hyperactivity. It's because it's got that anti um, fight or flight hormone response kind of thing. It can help with anxiety. And I've got a couple of patients with Angelman syndrome where it's been helpful. Constipation and tiredness are the big risks to watch for with that. Uh, lithium is a mood stabilizer medicine. I didn't mention it, but it could in very severe situations be considered. Um, Lithium is used for the treatment of bipolar disorder, which is a separate issue, but it's used in some cases for easy irritability in kids who have autism. So that makes it maybe potentially come to mind for cases where there's very severe aggression and self-injury. Um, and uh, in those situations, you need to monitor kidney, kidney function and um, uh, let's see, and weight gain. Okay. How about CBD oil question? So, um, yeah, CBD oil uh, is an interesting uh, product that people are talking a lot about. Yeah. Um, there are some studies with fragile X. And uh, the nice thing about CBD oil is, is, is a nice, uh, it has the potential to help with emotional regulation, with the irritability. Um, but sometimes, you know, we have these atypical antipsychotics like Risperdal, and um, Abilify that are targeted to emotional dysregulation, uh, but CBD oil has the potential to help with that without the, the big um, effect on appetite, weight gain, and all these metabolic side effects, and also the movement disorders mm-hmm. with higher doses that can come up. But the, the only thing is we, we haven't studied it enough. It's, there are studies going on for other neurodevelopmental disabilities, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential for this drug. And the problem is sometimes there are a lot of families that use the, the wings from the, um, uh, for Angerman syndrome from a family. The, there's um, the wings for Angerman syndrome patients. And, but the problem is that doses are kind of small and, and they may not be as effective, but, but many families report that it has been helpful for them. 
How about patients who've been on epidiolex? Have you noticed a difference in anxiety in those patients? Yeah, epidiolex seems to have a better dose and, and it seems to work better. But in order to qualify for the epidiolex, it's only approved for, for seizure disorders. But yeah, it's, it's, you can see, you can tell that it's like a more therapeutic dose and it can be more effective. Great. It's only approved for seizure disorders. Right. Um, sticking on the topic of medication here for a second, are there concerns with the timing if a patient is, say, on melatonin, clonidine, and trazodone all for sleep? Do we have to be worried about the timing of those or can they all be given around the same time? Uh, my take on this is that it really depends on um, an individual's response to those medicines individually before I feel comfortable adding a second one. I would never start all three at the same time. That would be dangerous. Right. Um, but if you start with one and it's like melatonin really doesn't seem like it's doing anything, then I feel more comfortable adding clonidine being given concurrently. And then you're treating with clonidine for a while and you have a sense you know, um, maybe you're seeing mild improvement, it's worthwhile, it's making a difference, um, then that is a situation where actually I might go ahead with trazodone, starting with a low dosage and even giving it concurrently. But you're really trying to space out those dosing changes, ideally by weeks to months to give something a full effect. And you should always be honest with asking yourself whether it's really helping, stop it if it's not, rather than just keep adding medicines. Yeah, good advice. Um, in, in either of your experience, have you seen Keppra cause anxiety? I, I've seen it cause what I thought was increased irritability and more frequent yeah. aggression, but that's pretty rare. I've actually never seen that in Angelman syndrome so far. I, I'd be interested if other people had that experience, but I've seen it in other um, kids or adults I've worked with with seizure disorders. The irritability. Yeah. Yeah. I have certainly heard anecdotally that that occurs less frequently in the Angelman population, but I do know of families who felt like the B6 was helpful because of the um, potential Keppra um, irritability, so. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Yeah, perfect. All right, let's pivot here a little bit um, and talk a little bit more about behaviors. Um, so we have a lot of good questions here. 22 questions in the chat box. We're going to work our way through here. <laughs> um, all right. Some good examples here um, of asking for tips on how to manage these. So um, an adult with Angelman syndrome repeatedly asking the same questions over and over again. Example, asking for mom when mom has recently, you know, left and is not around or indicating with AAC that she wants to watch a movie, but we've literally just finished a movie. What are, you know, tips or ideas to help explain Kind of what to expect what's happening when since this might be causing some anxiety i guess i'll jump in on this one <laughs> um yeah so we hear this we hear this quite often in clinic um it's a it's a common uh concern and um some of the strategies that we've heard have helped um are um using going back to visual cues using aac device reminding, shifting the, shifting the answer um, away from, again, giving that attention and diverting the attention to the pro proper answer somewhere else. So for example, um, if, if asking for mama, 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 maybe there's a picture of mama that says here, you know, you, here she is <laughs> and you yeah. hand it and that's it. And then you, there's no more answering of that question, no more responding to that question. There's a redirection to a different behavior. Um, so using, again, it's that differential reinforcement, it's sort of, the, of, of trying to shape the behaviors that you wanna see and reducing the behaviors um, that you don't wanna see. So, and, and using visual cues, so it doesn't rely on that language. Um, so what it is, it, a lot of this is individualized. So it depends on the situation in which your um, loved one is doing this. And, and we'd wanna do a functional behavioral analysis to determine, you know, when is this happening? Is it happening in a certain setting? Is it happening? Um, uh, at a certain time of day? Are there other uh, extenuating factors going on that may be um, increasing the anxiety that, that, that the individual may be feeling and therefore that's coming out in the um, repeated questioning? And then we'd go back to try to decide what type of um, behavioral strategies might be most useful. Have you seen things like visual schedules be helpful in this scenario? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, okay. yeah. 
to be able to anticipate what's coming next. How about, could you, could either of you elaborate on reward systems that you've seen be successful for perhaps encouraging certain behaviors or extinguishing certain behaviors? I think we usually use reward systems for encouraging desirable behavior, right? So if you just sit and focus on a task, right? So you would have a reinforcement system, you would have a timer, which you're setting a timer, like, okay, if you sit and do this for five minutes, and then when it's done, you will get a prize or you'll get to watch the iPad. I think the iPad is often used as a fantastic reward. And I think parents can get kids to work for it. Like first, we're going to do this, then you get your iPad and then using a visual system of like, what do you need to do? And then you get your reward. And I think for, for kids with instrument syndrome, I think the reward needs to happen right away. Uh, I think you can say, I'm going to give you a cookie at the end of dinner. It has to happen as soon right. as they finish the task. And I think it's really helpful to break down what you want into smaller segments. So they're more and more motivated to do something. So if you have a task to do, break it down into smaller parts, use a timer, or just say you need to finish this. Once you're done this, you get this. When you say small, do you mean like a 10 second timer or like a two minute timer? I think it depends on the child, but I think we can, we can easily start off with one or two minutes. It depends on the child and depends on the age, right? You, you be, I usually start off with one or two minutes and then modify it as needed, right? If the child can do two minutes, then I would increase it to three. If the child can do two minutes, I would decrease it to 30 seconds. Okay. I think the biggest thing is you want the child to be successful. Right. You know, you don't want him to fail. He, he should be getting the reward and then you increase what he needs to get the reward. Right. All right. Great question here. Um, how do we differentiate between a challenging behavior and someone just being a typical kid, teenager, adult, but with Angelman syndrome? I would say um, that it's, it is a subjective um, definition. So challenging behaviors means to, means what it means. It's challenging to someone. Um, so it's challenging either to the individual that it's challenging their quality of life. It's interfering with their ability to do things or it's challenging the people around them in a way that makes it hard for them to, to have a, a positive social interaction with them. So I, I, that's the way, that's sort of my um, litmus test. Like if it's something that is interfering and challenging to either the person or someone around them, then it's a challenging behavior. You know, yes, typically developing kids or just kid, kid behaviors can be challenging at times, but if it's consistent and it's, and it's again, interfering or challenging, um, then we want to maybe try to do something to change that. Absolutely. All right. Is there any information on older individuals with Angelman syndrome's behavior and anxiety abating with age? We did see that in our survey. So we did see that, uh, and our survey was cross um, sectional, which means we didn't follow kids over time. But um, uh, from the National History Study, we have that some of that data. Um, but in our study, we did see that the older individuals, those over 18, did seem to have a reduction in some of the behaviors that we were seeing more frequently in the adolescent young adult age. Great. Thank you. All right. A question, doctor, specifically for Dr. Sadwani. How do we figure out what situation might be causing a behavior? Um, so I, I think this is, um, I think one, one of the things when we're working with families, you, and we know sometimes kids have a lot of behaviors, right? So at, at, as Anne said, we'll focus on the one they really, which, which they like, they may be biting, they may be hearing, they may be uh, mouthing. So we start off with the behavior that uh, they, they're most concerned with, the first one they want to treat. For, for example, if it's biting, right? And then you would, we would have them do a behavior diary. So they will note every time they bite, right? And then we'll do a functional behavior analysis, like what happened just before they pop bit the person what did the child do and what happened after that so we usually have families track it for a few days to get a sense of if there's a pattern and then that's when we figure out if, if what what the behavior is and how can we change it how hard is it to get in to see one of you guys what is your wait time like and do you do virtual visits we're i feel like we're gonna be sending a lot of parents home to do <laughs> behavior diaries i'm gonna be doing one myself tonight or for the next month <laughs> What's the best way if a family wants to see one of you guys or, or to find a local behavior specialist? I think getting, um, reaching out to your school to, is one of the fastest ways. I think a lot, there's a lot of BCBAs in school who really specialize in working with some of these behaviors. And I think reaching out to your school district, especially if the behaviors are happening at school as well, and getting the BCBAs help and the behavior therapist help to do some of this functional behavior analysis for you and then coming up with suggestions. 
Similarly for adults, um, a lot of uh, day programs will have a behavioral consultant that'd be involved. In fact, if you're thinking about day programs for adults, you might try to look for day programs that have a behavioral consultant involved. Um, and that can also be a helpful resource just in the same way that Anjali is talking about for kids. That's a great tip. Um, I live in Illinois. Illinois is not great for services. Uh, and it's really hard to get um, a BCBA to help these families. Um, and, you know, in Illinois, you have to have other, I think in a lot of places, you have to have a diagnosis of autism to qualify for. And, and a lot of the ABA people want to give a lot of hours. There are not that many that do like a couple of hours a week um, using, you know, you could get a couple of hours a week with a Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO insurance or a private insurance, but uh, a lot of the ABA groups don't take this small amount of hours. That's that's the challenge that I have seen with some of our patients. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big challenge, certainly across the country, not just in Illinois, for sure. All right, a couple more great behavioral questions here. So what's um, some tips or the best way to handle jealousy between siblings with Angelman and typical siblings? Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things I recommend for all families, even for fa families, typically developing families, is to have, you know, if you have a visual schedule, you can assign a special time with mom or dad, right? So it's part of your schedule. It doesn't have to be very long. It can be 10 minutes, right? But it's a special time that's on the schedule that where, where the child is just with that parent and will do whatever the child wants. So I think that really helps because a lot of what these children want at this time is the attention. And I think assigning that, even if it's 10, as parents, you're spending so much time in your, in your day, but if it's on the schedule and you say, this is mommy and me special time, right? It becomes this really exciting event. And I think that really helps. I love that idea. I'm, I'm seeing a set of like um, um, handouts that we need to have like prepared in the clinics or, or downloadable, like visual schedule templates that we can put in with mommy and me time or, or, Daddy and me time, whatever it might be. Great idea. Yeah. All right. Yes, before yep. you move on, uh, could you, can someone speak more to, because there's been several questions that are coming up about um, how ABA can be helpful for individuals with Angelman syndrome, or if you've seen that? Um, Yes, it can be. Um, <laughs> uh, similar to some of the other services, ABA is um, sometimes very hard to get access to. Um, but I think there has been at least one study, and I may be there may be others that have actually looked specifically at the um, how ABA can help in Angelman and and found positive results. Uh, there's always uh, there's always a concern with dosage. I think too much ABA can be really too hard um, on people. Uh, at every stage, but so, you know, you'd wanna um, work with a specialist who knows an Angelman and can help kind of tailor what the treatment should look like. And I, I think well, I think ABA is really helpful, you know, not only just for learning and schoolwork, but also issues like behavioral challenges, toilet sure. training. It's, it's been really helpful. And I think as Anne said, you wanna work with an ABA therapist or BCB or agency who's flexible enough to not just do a discrete trial training, but able to incorporate your AAC into the sessions yeah. and setting up goals. I think parents have a lot of input in setting up the goals that you want and then ha have ABA work on it. For example, if numbers is not your goal, we can have ABA work on toilet training. We can have ABA work on attention, sitting, focus. We can focus on, on those kinds of things. Great tips. Great tips. All right. Amanda, anything else that you're noticing coming up as a theme here? Um, so much. Uh, <laughs> so many questions. Would you guys be okay staying on for like 10 more minutes to answer a few more questions? Okay, great. Perfect. So Liz, go ahead and yeah, let's do a few more. I was going to pivot back to medications here yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. good idea. Um... Let's see. Oh, natural supplements or diets to help reduce anxiety. That's come up a couple of times. Anyone seen any benefit from diet? I, um, I've had some uh, families tell me that really high sugar foods can exacerbate issues around hyperactivity, which makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, thinking about the, the diet and sort of how 
um, intensely packed it might be for sugar there. You, you might look at whether that's a, a factor. So I'm imagining um, completing your FBA that's looking at some of the behavioral challenges and maybe you're writing in there if they notice any connection with diet. Um, yeah. There's a, um, a lot about diet when it comes to the control of seizures um, and controlling seizures can have effects on behavior. Um, I think less known in terms of whether the dietary change has direct effects on the behavior itself. Yeah. I, I do work with a lot of families that have like autism conditions too. And, and that's a common question there. And I, um, you know, a lot of people try these casein-free, gluten-free diets. Um, and, um, but I, if you look at the literature, there's not really strong evidence, but I, I think, you know, if a family believes in one of those, I think it's important to have, they can try, but um, I usually advise them to try to work with a dietitian to make sure that all the nutritional needs are covered if they wanna try something like that. Absolutely. Yes, all right, great. How about use of low-dose diazepam situationally? Say a child is not experiencing a lot of anxiety when they're in their preferred environment with their preferred caregivers, but you know, for small family gatherings or outings around town, low-dose, diazepam or clonazepam in that setting? Yeah, that's something that we, we try and it makes sense to, to try those for these particularly stressful situations. I remember prescribing something like that for a family where they were traveling and, and one time they had to stop their travel plans because uh, their angel could not get into the plane and they were kind of traumatized. And, and then we tried that and that made it so much easier and smooth. Great. That's a great anecdotal, some great anecdotal evidence. Dr. Carey, you found it helpful as well in that yeah, setting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, uh, I've seen the situation um, where clinicians have like a seven day course of low dosage of diazepam. And um, it seemed like it helped with almost, um, if a behavior, a really challenging behavior became sort of a learned routine where it was happening in this circumstance every time that it helped in some ways in terms of um, breaking some of the association with that particular event with, for aggression or self-injury and they didn't need to continue it long-term. That's always a win when that happens. So it's, it's worth considering diazepam is long acting. So being careful about how often it's given because it can build up in the body over time and should. Um, so we one thing to be cautious about. Great. And that segues into this next question here. How about long-term use of other medications like uh, Risperdal? Is it safe to be on these medications long-term or are these more short term medications? So we, we do have, I do have some patients that are on Risperdal, Abilify, Quetipine, and um, it's not ideal, but sometimes they, they do address these big uh, behavioral emotional challenges, this irritability and makes the life much easier. And something that we try to do is we try to monitor for the side effects. Like we need to check, you know, we check, we monitor for diabetes, we monitor for cholesterol, we check on the weight, yeah. And, and we try to give also, it's not just the medication, but also sometimes, you know, addressing, bringing down the intensity of the emotions can make these uh, patients available to get the therapy, to get the ABA, to try other interventions. And then, you know, when possible, we try to try trade down yeah. um, these medications. There's been several questions tonight about families who are interested in potentially coming off of medications. Maybe their child or their adult with Angelman syndrome has been on multiple medications for many years. What's your advice to a family who's interested in maybe peeling back some of those medications? I, I think it's a great question. I think um, a, every, all prescribing clinicians should continue to ask themselves on a routine basis whether this person still needs to take this medication. Situations change, people can get more supports, maybe before they had ABA, um, they, we needed a medicine, they were on a six month wait list, they got an ABA team they love, maybe we don't need it anymore. Did the circumstance change? Um, changes should probably usually be gradual, um, you know, maybe making dosage decreases in a two to four week period to get a full sense of what's going on. I really like to include the schools or day programs in terms of discussion about this um, so they can give feedback, um, hopefully not too suggestible. Um, they can give you feedback in terms of how you're doing, but um, we should continue to ask ourselves whether these medicines are needed and can people have med holidays? 
Yeah, absolutely. I know it seems stressful to families to think about changing maybe when things seem kind of stable, but yeah. when children or adults are on lots of medications, I certainly understand the desire to peel some of those back. All right, here's a specific question. So, uh, uh, as my 16 year old daughter takes clonidine and clonazepam for sleep. She does fall asleep, but she wakes up in the middle of the night for a little bit. Would adding trazodone be something reasonable for nighttime wake ups? I, um, I, you know, trazodone is a really good medication. It's not like um, Dr. Kerry mentioned, it's not our first line. We always try first um, um, hygiene, sleep hygiene interventions, then we go to melatonin, then we try clonidine. But uh, really for nighttime awakenings, I feel trazodone is a very effective medication and has a nice side effect profile. But, you know, going back to a question that was asked before, you ideally, you want to measure, you know, you want to try too many medications for the same thing. So you may want to add, and then if you see, I, I don't pull out something that may be working right away, but sometimes what I do is I may add, and if I see a positive signal, I may try to start winning off the one that didn't seem to help as much. Gotcha. Great advice. What about chamomile and magnesium supplements for their calming effects? Mm. Chamomile. Any success? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think the idea of chamomile, um, tea or um, uh, essential oils, I've had patients who found that really helpful as part of a nighttime routine before yeah. bed and calming. Um, and that's beautiful. If something like that helps, it's certainly worth trying. Um, and uh, magnesium, I've, uh, I've seen that tried for kids who have persistent hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't do it as much myself, but I have a neuro neurology colleague who's given it a try who felt like it was helpful. Um, so I know a little bit less about that, but it's not outside of the realm of sure. a reasonable thing to try. Um, and uh, I, I see it, some families felt they had improvement with it. Yeah. What about Benadryl for sleep? Uh, Benadryl. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I, I'm jumping in. Uh, we're maybe switching off. I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I've definitely had patients who had it, felt that it was uh, helpful. Um, you can see sedation, more grogginess the next day. Uh, Dr. Ochoa talked about um, paradoxical responses to medications, so more irritable, more hyperactive. That can happen at Benadryl, so you know, watch for that. Yeah. At high dosage of Benadryl, you can get urinary retention, so that's another something to watch for. Um, and uh, so grogginess the next day, it's a big thing to be concerned for in constipation. Gotcha. Anything else? Anything we haven't covered for medicines for sleep? I think we've gone pretty deep there. All right. Maybe just a few more. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then I will reiterate to everybody, all of this, this will all be recorded. This has been recorded and it will be available and the slides will be available. I know everyone's frantically right. And I would also say, Liz, we're going to, the questions that don't get answered, we're going to work really hard to get those answered for you. We'll reach out to you separately on the ones that don't get answered or get asked during this time. Okay, perfect. Because we have a lot left. Okay, great. Here's, here's, um, yeah, there's a lot, there's 15 questions left. That's okay. We will, we will get them answered and we will get them back to folks. Um, our 22 year old son who's deletion positive within the past year has fallen into the severe category for anxiety and behavior with many self injurious behaviors. You've mentioned movement disorders as a potential problem that develops with antipsychotics. How often do you find that this has happened in Angelman syndrome and is it reversible if it develops? So what, what medication is he taking now? I couldn't hear. I'm not sure that he's on one. I think we were just, the question is. That's considering the possibility of yeah, using exactly. the, um, antipsychotics. So yeah. you, you can see them, um, the, the antipsychotics can cause movement disorders. When you go, as you go up on the dose, there's more risk for, for having the movement disorders. And uh, the, it's, it's kind of, it can be dose dependent and it can also be individual dependent. Some people have more, are more prone to have those side effects when, when, if you see them and if they are significant, you may wanna wean off the medication or try like a different medication. And oftentimes they, they come down, but sometimes it can be a little persistent, um, those movements. Um, Chris? Yeah, they're dose dependent side effects oftentimes, although not always. So you might be able to get away of lowering the dosage a little bit. Um, okay. So improve or spreading it out throughout the day. 
that's encouraging. So these side effects are not something that's seen more frequently in the angel wind population, and they should be reversible if we see them. The one thing I see more commonly is if it causes fatigue, it can sometimes worsen people's motor function. But that, again, it comes to medicines that cause fatigue can have that as a concern. Um, so that's an important one to watch for. Gotcha. Okay. And then a question about um, clonazepam. That's a medicine that a lot of children with Angelman syndrome are on and for both seizure control, but also for anxiety. Um, this was not one of the ones that were mentioned. So have you guys had good experience with patients on clonazepam or what's been your experience? I, I haven't used it much, but I, I've seen that uh, a lot of the patients that are on clonazepam can be very tired during the day and that can enhance irritability sometimes. Um, Chris? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that can absolutely be the case. I will see it prescribed a lot for myoclonus, clonazepam. Um, yeah. Of course, a common problem in Angelman syndrome. It can be, can be really helpful. And then I've seen a couple of situations where they tried to come off the clonazepam and behaviors got worse. So yeah. I do think it can be helpful um, for behavioral concerns and it could be multiple, address multiple issues with one medicine. That can be good. Um, just be careful about using it for sleep. If someone has sleep apnea, benzodiazepines, that class of medicines are not recommended if people have sleep apnea. Yeah, um, ensuring that's not what's going on. Hmm. Super helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. I do think we're going to have to bring this panel to an end as, as riveting as this has been and as much fabulous information as you all have given us tonight. We will get all of these questions answered, I promise, and get them back to their the folks who've asked them. Amanda, do you have anything that you need to yeah, say? Yeah, I would just I would just say a couple things. One, everyone on this panelist um, has graciously agreed to work with the Angelman Syndrome Foundation to create kind of a treatment guidelines around anxiety and behavior. So we're going to be working on putting together resources that you can use at, you know, with your care teams at home. So all this information that you heard tonight, our goal is to put that in paper to help you know, to give it to you guys for, um, for support. I would also say that, you know, most of our Angelman syndrome clinics have these amazing individuals there that can really work with you. Um, if you can't, if you can't find a specialist where you are, or they can consult with a specialist at your hometown too, right? I mean, so Dr. Carey and I were just talking the other day, like, how can we somehow give these individuals licensing to where they can telehealth all over the world because our families are constantly wanting to have sessions with them. And if we can't do that, what can we do? And a lot of, in a lot of ways, these, these individuals are willing to do, you know, do a consult with your team back home to work through some of this as well. So I'd say definitely try to get to a clinic. If you have questions about clinics, you can always call the foundation and we can work through that. But um, I know this is just, there's still questions coming through like <laughs> as we're still talking. So we will make sure to get those questions answered. I think next year, maybe we'll have an anxiety and behavior panel part one and then a part two. But I would say tomorrow night also, we have our, our seizure conversation with Dr. Ron Thiebert. Some of these questions may be relevant for him tomorrow night. So make sure you show up. Um, he will be able to answer um, a lot of your questions, any of your questions related to seizures. So make sure you show up tomorrow night. I have to end really quickly because I've asked every one of the panelists just to briefly say, because I think this is a really good way to end our time with our community. If you could just within like one to five seconds, say something to the community, something that you're most excited about for the Angelman community right now. What excites you about our community and what's happening? Anyone can go. Uh, I, I go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> You're both go ahead. so excited. <laughs> oh, there are so many things I'm excited about for this community. I think um, I love seeing how everyone has been coming together, um, working together, and um, even, even when we can't see each other in person virtually, uh, the community just is bonded and it's wonderful to see that. Awesome. I actually echo Anne, I was gonna say the same thing. I have been amazed from day one when I started 10 years ago about the cohesiveness of the community. And I'm just in awe of how close-knit and supportive everybody is. I, I love working with the Angelman syndrome patients. I've been fortunate to work with since babies all the way to um, young adults and they have this 
uh, this is spark, this oh. charisma, and uh, you know, it's, I feel so blessed to have the opportunity to work with them. I love the, the spark and the charisma. That's a great way to describe them for sure. That's awesome. And Chris. Yeah, I mean, you don't get to be an expert without being educated by the families. Um, and I, I felt like uh, that had a warm welcome with so many of the families that I've worked with uh, over the years that um, have allowed me to be able to say that I'm an expert in this. And I'm so thankful for the families um, that I've worked with over the years and uh, look forward to continuing to work with. Absolutely. Well, thank you for staying on a couple extra minutes for us all. We are so thankful for each one of you as a parent. I know Liz and I can say we are so blessed to have you guys and your minds working on this in this community and supporting our kids. I'm sure everyone that's on the panel right now, by the way, this is the largest attended session we've had yet just so you know. So you can tell where the issues are in our community is obviously with the anxiety and behavior. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm sure they're saying the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for dedicating your careers and adding Angelman to your profile. We so appreciate it. We guys hope you have an amazing night and we will see you hopefully tomorrow night at 8 PM for the seizure talk. See you guys later. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Nice work. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.